No, I, I once ran into this Frenchman on the street and I knocked the wind out of him and he said to me when I was about 14, are you planning to run like that for the rest of your life? I said, yes, sir, it looks that way. He said, well, bon voyage, bon voyage. And I ran to school and the following week I met him and we began to take these walks in the park and they were numinous. And he would say, oh, Jeanne, Jeanne, look, look, a caterpillar. Mm. Jeanne, what is a caterpillar? Huh? Moving, changing, transforming, metamorphosis. Jeanne, feel yourself to be a caterpillar. Can you do it? Oh, very easily, Mr. I called him Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor. And feel your transformation. Or, or Jeanne, sniff the wind. <laughs> Same wind once sniffed by Jesus Christ. <laughs> ah, Marie Antoinette. <laughs> ah, Jeanne d'Arc, feel be filled with Joan of Arc, you know. And, and it was extraordinary. Everything was sentient. Everything was full of life. He looked at you. He looked at you as the, a kind of the cluttered house that hid the Holy One. And you felt yourself looked at as if you were God in hiding. And you felt yourself so charged and greened with evolutionary possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I used to go home and tell my mother, Mother, I met my old man, and when I am with him, I leave my littleness behind. And of course, I found out years later, after he died, it was Teilhard de Chardin I was meeting. It's an interesting yeah. phrase, I leave my littleness Leave my littleness behind, behind. yes. It seems that for many of us, I know in my own life, at times yes. we get so caught up in our littleness, we forget there's anything else. Well, we don't have time to do that anymore, do we? I mean, we are living in the most complex times in human history. I realize other times in history thought they were it. They're wrong. This is it. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we do in my travels around the world, which now are almost a quarter of a million miles, working in many cultures and many, many domains of human experience, I really discover that maybe we have 10 or 15 years of an open corridor to make a difference. Many people all over the world are really haunted by this. They wake up with a sense that they just cannot live out their lives as encapsulated bags of skin dragging around dreary little egos. And that all the walls are crashing down. I mean, we have extraordinary, the membranes are, have cracked through as cultures begin to flow into each other. We are on the verge of a true planetary culture with high individuation of individual cultures. Cultures are becoming more so, not less. The potentials of different cultures, the potentials, for example, of an African culture that I have studied, which has no history of war, no neurosis as we understand it, incredible problem solving. And when I studied this culture in West Africa, and I saw how they solved problems, they didn't say, uh, yes, what is it, A, yes, subsection one, two, three, no. First they danced the problem. And then they sang it, and they danced it, and then they envisioned it, and then they drew it, and they talked about it, and they danced it, then they dreamed it, and they all had the solution. Mm -hmm. Because they were operating on many, many frames of mind. Well, in the harvest of world culture that is happening in our time, what we are gaining is not only different frames of mind, thinking in images, thinking in words, thinking with our whole bodies, but we are gaining access to the ecology of the genius of the human race. We are all becoming Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, but accessing mm -hmm. this incredible domain of, of the human genius. And mm. so that we discover, for example, that we are in a state of chronic education. I have never met a stupid child. I have met incredibly stupid systems of education that diminish our ideas of ourselves, that give us a very limited local notion and we can't get away with it anymore. And we have, we have incredible access to who and what we are. It's not for nothing that the whole earth, as an image, is in our mind at the same time as the whole brain, the whole mind, mm -hmm. and all these cultures converging and, 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 what should we say, regestating each other. I guess there's a sense in which, if, if we look at the animal kingdom, how each species manages to, to develop some unique quality of, of what an animal can do. It's as if cultures each foster different aspects of what it is like to be human, what is possible for yes, a I human. Think, I think that is so. And now for the first time in human history, it's as if we are, have all these cultures that are coming together mm -hmm. because of planetization because of the rise of women to full partnership with men in the whole domain of human affairs, because we have such easy access to each other, by the year 2000, this is going to be a world of colossal busybodiness. Mm -hmm. you know, anybody will be able to call mm -hmm. anybody. I remember a year and a half ago, I was in the Orinoco, deep in the jungle, and out comes from the jungle a man, naked, who probably had never seen a wheeled vehicle, with a transistor radio clapped to his ear, probably listening to the ball game from <laughs> Mexico City, so that we have this extraordinary uh, mm -hmm. interdependent uh, world. And then, of course, we have the access to mm -hmm. 
the understanding of human potentials. We're living in the golden age of the understanding of who and what we can be. Well, what you're saying is, uh, is that we have access to all of the knowledge that has been accumulated in all of the cultures throughout the history of humanity. And s sufficient crisis and complexity and radical need to make use of this knowledge, which mm -hmm. we did not have to do when we were just men and women in search mm -hmm. of subsistence or living within tribal or nation mm -hmm. states. Isn't there also a backlash? Of course there is. Going on. I mean, whenever you are on the verge of so much more, people say, oh, um, I don't think so, no, no, back to basics, back to fundamentalist fortresses of truth, back to sanctifying of mediocrity. And also the incredible yearning for a pattern that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And we're in a time in which literally we whole, all systems are in transition. Everything has shaken down into chaos. Everything is breaking down. Standard brand governments, politics, economics, religions, relationships. And we are probably in the greatest shaking up in human history. And so what we are seeing is the sunset effect. You no, know, the mm -hmm. sun gets brighter and blazes out before it goes down. Yeah. The sunset effect of all the traditional ways of knowing, seeing, being and the rising of fundamentalisms. But I don't think that's gonna last very long because the world is simply too complex. I've often said we're educated for a much earlier era, not for <clears throat> the immense complexity of who and what we are in human history. And people are discovering that the need, the yearning that I find literally all over the world to become what we can be. And that's one of the main reasons why we find, we find myth rising yeah. all over the world. Because myth gives us the kind of coding in the story of ourselves writ large as the hero and heroine of a thousand faces. It gives us access to a much larger story. And all of us are on the verge of becoming citizens in a universe larger than our aspiration and much more complex than all our dreams. Mm -hmm. Myths are rising everywhere. I remember last year, <clears throat> I was in India, a year and, I guess it was a year and a half ago, on Sunday, all of India stops to watch the great television program of the great mythic drama of India, the myth, the Ramayana, mm -hmm. the story of the king, the young prince, Sita's search for his beloved wife who has been abducted by the demons. Uh, 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 Sita, the young pr prince, is Rama, yes. searching for Sita. And I was in one of those villages, one of the 600,000 villages, and almost everyone seems to have a television set, one set. In the center of the village. In the center of the village. Mm -hmm. And so you see people coming in with their water buffalo and leaving them and taking the water jugs off their head and sitting down around the set. <clears throat> and I was sitting next to an older lady. And she was watching the story of poor Sita, just beleaguered and not being able to do anything for herself. And she says, oh, I don't like this story of Sita. She is too weak. She is too passive. I said, oh, what do you mean? That's beautiful, an elaborate story. Ah, no, you see, you see, my name is Sita. And my husband's name is Rama, very common in India. And my husband is a lazy bum and I do most of the work. And we've got to show that. We've got to change the story, change the story to see how strong women are today. And she was actually talking about the, how the myth had to grow. Well, after this beautiful, beautiful story, guess what followed it all over India on television? Dynasty. <laughs> I was so immoral. I was incredibly embarrassed. I mean, I just... And it's but it's a story about strong that's women. That's what she said. She said, oh, sister, why are you so embarrassed? Don't you realize it is the same story? I said, well, how do you mean? You've got a good lady. You've got a bad lady. <laughs> you've got a good man. You've got a bad man. You've got a beautiful house. You've got a beautiful clothes. You've got a war against good and evil. Oh, yes, indeed. It is the same story. She was absolutely right. Oh, see, interesting. Yeah. Well, you <coughs> travel all over the world, Jean. Mm -hmm. You probably put on as many miles as, as anybody I know. Whoever lived practically <laughs> at this point. You, you are called uh -huh. in as a consultant by many different governments. You governments and human development agencies, United Nations. Heads of state occasionally. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes, more than occasionally. You're spreading uh, the gospel of human potential everywhere. Well, I work in a different way, though, you see. What I will do is I'll go and I'll live in a culture, mm -hmm. you know, for a period of time. And I don't mean the Bombay Hilton either, <laughs> you know, I mean, I will live in huts with the peasants and, and with the people of the land, and mm -hmm. I, will, I will get to know many different strata of the society and get a sense of what is trying to happen. And then I'll hold, I'll give a lot of speeches too, you know, and then I'll hold a seminar, often with the leaders or the evocateurs of the culture. 
for perhaps 10 or 12 or 15 days, and we'll be locked up together. And I will start with their core myth, like, for example, with India, it might be the Ramayana, or when I was in Burma, it was the life of Buddha, mm -hmm. or something like that. And uh, we will take these great stories and lift them out as the drama of their own potentials, and we will, I'll integrate a great many physical, mental, psychological, and spiritual processes and exercises that are keyed to the story, but are also keyed to the releasing of the potentials of the culture. Mm -hmm. What can education in Taiwan be? What can a new social uh, ethic in South Africa be? And using these coded stories that often contain the multiple levels of what can happen. And it, mm -hmm. and it seems to work, and people then, then continue with this kind of work and mm -hmm. take it and change the schools and the hospitals and the social systems. There, there's a great paradox, though, of you, the American mm -hmm. woman, coming in and giving, in effect, their culture back to them. I agree, and I don't know why it works, but it does. <laughs> and also, I don't look like them, yeah. you see, because I'm nearly six feet tall, and often they're mm -hmm. rather small people. No, it's, it's being a woman mm -hmm. that is an advantage, because I don't come in telling them what to do. I come in as a deep listener and also as a student. I've spent a lot of time mm -hmm. learning as much about their culture, so I am as full of questions for them as they are for me. Mm -hmm. So it really is interdependent and is a mutual sharing. There's a wonderful story you tell me about your encounter with, in Australia with an Aborigine woman. Yes, yes, that was wonderful. It was several years ago. Um, we were in the center of Australia, and she was showing me how to find food. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how can you find food here? I mean, it's, it's, it's barren, there's nothing here. And she said, what, what is it? You don't see. Look at these beautiful grasses. Sip the sweet resin. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Look, you see that sinkhole there, mate? Look, under that hole, look what we're going to find. Oh, a beautiful tuba. Ah, under that rock there. Oh, lovely mealy grubs. What a dinner we're going to have. How can you live seeing as little as you do? And how indeed. I mean, here she was leading my blind urbanity mm -hmm. to see nature's secrets. Yeah. And then I asked her, how do we different human beings differ from the others, from the koala bear, from the wallaby, from the kangaroo, the animals? She says, why, why, mate? We're the ones who can tell the stories about all the others. And that was our humanity. Yeah.